So today, I'm just gonna let people come at their own pace. We're gonna finish up the opioids segment, which we've been kind of lagging on for a bit, and I'm never updating my computer again. And then uh, time permitting, we're gonna start on the medication segment, which I'm sure many of you are really interested in because obviously medications are a huge point of interaction with a lot of substances. So getting a better idea for how major medications work, specifically things like SSRIs and antipsychotics and benzodiazepines, et cetera, it's gonna give us a bit of a, bit of a better idea of um, what things will interact and how. But um, before we do that, I want to finish up on the opioid crisis. And this is something that we'll revisit in different like ways in the future. But for now, uh, we kind of left off last time with talking about three of the major things that have contributed to the opioid crisis, which are overdose and disease and economic reasons. So I pose to you this, a situation in which a person, because there are many routes by which someone can get involved in doing opioids, and it doesn't necessarily mean that a person is going to have a problematic relationship with an opioid just because they're doing it. And that's an important distinction for us to make. Um, generally speaking, the scientific and medical communities will distinguish medical use and abuse. And there isn't really much of a middle ground that is talked about by medical professionals or legal professionals even in a lot of cases. So I wanna make that distinction very clear is that just because someone is not using something medically or as prescribed by a physician doesn't necessarily mean that they are abusing it because what does that really mean necessarily? That could just mean that a person is using it for recreational purposes or in theogenic purposes or really whatever they've decided they want to get out of that substance that isn't necessarily specifically medically what it's intended for. So for instance, um, people like Dr. Carl Hart, who is one of the biggest names in drug policy and drug activism right now, is a doctor of drug studies who likes to do heroin occasionally because it's recreational for him and is very pleasant and allows him to wind down after a long day of work. And he wrote about this in his new book, Drug Use for Grownups, which is a fantastic read. And it's been making a wave everywhere because people kind of generally assume that if you use an opioid, like heroin specifically, you're addicted to it, you have a problem with it, it should be intervened with. And well, in many cases, that is the case because people often will go into it not really knowing how to anticipate and how to identify and respond to it if they develop a problematic relationship with that substance. Um, there are people that can use them casually, recreationally, or medically as directed with extreme success. So when we're looking at how we got to the point that we're at right now with like tens and tens of thousands of overdose deaths specifically due to opioids and like a lot of people taking opioids on a regular basis, we need to really look at what exactly is causing these fatalities and these casualties. And in terms of actual deaths from opioids, um, a lot of what we're seeing is in the realm of overdose, because if you're administering opioids in a way that is not under supervision, if you can't really get your dosage correct, if you have an adulterated substance, then obviously your risk of overdose is going to go way up, which could be avoided with safe supply. And then the same with disease, which is often through shared contaminated materials or, again, not safe supply, um, like HIV, for instance, or abscesses or other similar things that are results of a lack of access to safer administration practices, safer use practices. And then there's the economic component of things. Um, it's generally a lot cheaper and easier to find either cheap, illicitly pressed pills, like Mboxes, oxycodone pills right now are like all fentanyl. It's If they're on the illicit market, at least, if you're buying prescription opioids that aren't actually from a doctor, that aren't actually prescription opioids, they're almost guaranteed to not contain the ingredient that you want because why would they if they can just press fentanyl into it and it's like the same effect or if they could press a benzo into it and people will be fooled which in the case of regular opioid users people can usually tell the difference um, but the economic thing here is really important to realize and understand that whatever is cheap and available if you are using out of necessity to keep yourself from getting dope sick then you will go the cheapest route and this leaves a lot of room for cutting agents this leaves a lot of room for purchasing um, street side this leaves a lot of room for the healthcare system to fail people, basically. And it's so complicated. I wish that I had all the time in the world to go into specifically how complicated it is. But what I'm getting at is that the cycle that creates the opioid crisis is one that is rooted in people who are disadvantaged in some way, 
being taken advantage of by a system that fails them in some way, either if it's the medical system or just like the social public health mentality around opioid use, um, who often are entrapped in cycles. And these cycles can include like mounting medical bills, loss of housing, loss of employment due to drug screenings, for instance, that's a major thing. And then having a criminal record because of that and having the criminal record be per perpetuated because you keep using to not be dope sick and then you fail your tests and you fail your probation and um, having jail time prevents you from getting hired in most places if you're a felony or can convict if you're a felon. So anyway, this is a big enmeshed system and it's difficult to tease one thing out from, from another. Um, I wanna point this out here. This was in 1999 to 2019. This orange line is what everyone's talking about is the fact that we're seeing again, tens of thousands of deaths from opioids, but specifically synthetic opioids are like the major thing that is on the market right now. Now, synthetic opioids like fentanyl started really rising to prevalence in around 2015, and they've just continued skyrocketing since then. But it's not just synthetic opioids. We're also just seeing an interesting change in the prescription opioid market as a whole. The more synthetic opioids rise to the market to fill the growing demand, because of X, Y, Z reasons, the more we're going to see a variety in what's available and a change in the toxicity profiles. So people tend to believe that it's mostly heroin that causes overdose deaths, but that's actually not the case. Heroin is actually pretty like comparable to synthetic opioids or prescription opioids specifically in this realm. Like people are trying to get both. And what leads like chicken and the egg one to the other isn't really important here in terms of how we address the problem because safe supply is the answer to this problem. Are the horror stories about abscesses and necrosis from crocodile use because of poor injection practices? Um, no, crocodile is comprised of household chemicals. And those household chemicals, even if you're using proper injection practices, they are toxic to the injection site. So that's a distinction to make is like, if you're injecting something that is toxic to your skin, to your dermis, like the upper couple, upper couple of layers or to your fat layers, then that will cause problems even if you're using proper injection practices. If you're injecting something that is not actually going to be toxic directly to your skin, but you're using shitty practices, then you can inject bacteria and that will have the same negative effect. We're seeing a massive increase in prescription opioid distribution, or we were seeing a massive increase in prescription opioid dis distribution. But here's the thing is, I mentioned this last time, we get to 2011, we start hitting the opioid crisis, opioid deaths start rising all of a sudden and prescribers freak out. And one of the things that caused this to happen in the first place was that prescribers were like, I don't wanna be held liable for this. I'm going to pull prescriptions so that people that have been on opioids for X amount of time aren't, uh, at risk of addiction by my hand, basically. So I can't get sued for what I'm doing or whatever. And this just was, like dumped a bunch of people in the dust trying to figure out what to do with themselves when their script was pulled all of a sudden. Like, what are you gonna do, you know? And I know I touched on this last time, um, but I wanna go back just a little bit further than this as well. At the start of opioids getting really distributed, they were initially exclusively for people that had, um, post-op pain or cancer patients. That was like largely what opioids were used for. And then in 1996, Purdue Pharma um, started producing OxyContin. And in this five-year period, they put out this outlandish claim that less than 1% of people who used it got addicted to it. This was their figure that they used. And then immediately thereafter, we started seeing a massive increase in prescriptions as well as deaths that, that just like coincided with each other because of course they coincided with each other, you know? So it's a pretty clear cause and effect in this situation where there was this like swarm of availability of this thing that was touted as being extremely safe comparatively. And then all of a sudden people were experiencing problems. Um, and this is like, again, the cycle cascades where a person inadvertently becomes dependent on an opioid from prescriptions and then finds themselves withdrawing unless they can do something about it. And if your access is limited, especially if you were caught off guard, you're gonna do what you need to to continue living your life. And now on the other side of the coin, there are people that start using um, opioids in the form of like buying prescriptions off label and using them with their friends or like specifically seeking out things like heroin. 
And yeah, that of course that happens. But the question is whether or not we would still be seeing the number of casualties that we are if those same people had access to correct information about what constitutes a possible dependence on a substance, how to navigate things like withdrawal, how to identify if you're developing a problematic relationship with a substance, how to check in with yourself and be like, this is a limit and I'm crossing it, how to know if your family history or personal history puts you more or less at use. But more so than that, we have to ask ourselves if people were raised in environments or were adults in environments that were economically, mentally, emotionally supportive, would people be seeking things knowing that they could develop a problematic relationship with it and push back through that envelope? And in some cases it would be yes, but generally I would say that it's probably a lot more likely that if people felt really stable and cared for socially and societally, we just wouldn't see what we're seeing right now to this extent in terms of like problematic relationships with substances developing. These things are perpetuated by a lack of resources, by a lack of care and a lack of affection and a lack of ability to move forward through space. You know, like your environment really dictates how you respond to a substance that you use. So in terms of this whole thing about doctors prescribing opioids, which is really what a lot of people want to talk about when they talk about opioid use and the opioid crisis, a lot of the time doctors will just not completely accurately convey the potential for withdrawal and they won't use distinguishing terms between like addiction versus dependence and how you can have one or not the other or both, how they're not mutually exclusive. So this is kind of like a big part of this problem is that people, again, are kind of inadvertently signing up for something that they don't want. Now, on the other hand, something else that we're seeing right now is that because of the opioid crisis, people that actually could really use opioids are refusing to take them because of the horror stories that they've heard about people getting addicted to them, becoming dependent on them, whatever. So the pendulum has swung and it continues to swing super far in both directions. And this is a problem that could be rectified if we had more easily available drug education and information about like what these substances do. But again, a lot of the time, like soccer moms break their foot, go in, get surgery, take home a, a hydrocodone prescription, and then they run out of their script and there's no tapering advice provided. And they're like, shit, I don't know what I can do about this. Can I get a refill? They can't get a refill, but their friend has some Vicodin or whatever, and that helps them get through it. And it, it just is one of those things where it can be accidental in many cases. It can be informed in some cases, but no matter what the cause, a lack of education about what's going on is at the root of all of this. So again, this issue of pulling prescriptions is one of the major contributing factors to what happens here. Are so addictive, it helps to trace how these drugs affect the human body from the first dose through repeated use to what happens when long-term use stops. Each of these drugs has slightly different chemistry, but all act on the body's opioid system by binding to opioid receptors in the brain. The body's endorphins temper pain signals by binding to these receptors, and opioid drugs bind much more strongly for longer. So opioid drugs can manage much more severe pain than endorphins can. Opioid receptors also influence everything from mood to normal bodily functions. With these functions too, opioids binding strength and durability mean their effects are more pronounced and widespread than those of the body's natural signaling molecules. When a drug binds to opioid receptors, it triggers the release of dopamine, which is linked to feelings of pleasure and may be responsible for the sense of euphoria that characterizes an opioid high. At the same time, opioids suppress the release of noradrenaline, which influences wakefulness, breathing, digestion, and blood pressure. A therapeutic dose decreases noradrenaline enough to cause side effects like constipation. At higher doses, opioids can decrease heart and breathing rates to dangerous levels, causing loss of consciousness and even death. Over time, the body starts to develop a tolerance for opioids. It may decrease its number of opioid receptors, or the receptors may become less responsive. It's called down regulation. To experience the same release of dopamine and resulting mood effects as before, people have to take larger and larger doses, a cycle that leads to physical dependence and addiction. 
as people take more opioids to compensate for tolerance, noradrenaline levels become lower and lower to a point that could impact basic bodily functions. The body compensates by increasing its number of noradrenaline receptors so it can detect sensitivity to noradrenaline allows the body to continue functioning normally. In fact, it becomes dependent on opioids to maintain the new balance. When someone who is physically dependent on opioids stops taking them abruptly, that balance is disrupted. Noradrenaline levels can increase within a day of ceasing opioid use, but the body takes much longer to get rid of all the extra noradrenaline receptors it made. That means there's a period of time when the body is too sensitive to noradrenaline. This oversensitivity causes withdrawal symptoms, including muscle aches, stomach pains, fever, and vomiting. Though temporary, opioid withdrawal can be incredibly debilitating. In serious cases, someone in withdrawal can be violently ill for days or even weeks. People who are addicted to opioids aren't necessarily using the drugs to get high anymore, but rather to avoid being sick. Many risk losing wages or even jobs while in withdrawal, or may not have anyone to take care of them during withdrawal. If someone goes back to using opioids later, they can be at particularly high risk for overdose because what would have been a standard dose while their tolerance was high can now be lethal. Since 1980, accidental deaths from opioid overdose have grown exponentially in the United States, and opioid addictions have also exploded around the world. While opioid painkiller prescriptions are becoming more closely regulated, cases of overdose and addiction are still increasing, especially among younger people. Many of the early cases of addiction were middle-aged people who became addicted to painkillers they had been prescribed or received from friends and family members with prescriptions. Today, young people are often introduced to prescription opioid drugs in those ways, but move on to heroin or illicit synthetic opioids that are cheaper and easier to come by. Beyond tighter regulation of opioid painkillers, what can we do to reverse the growing rates of addiction and overdose? A drug called naloxone is currently our best defense against overdose. Naloxone binds to opioid receptors, but doesn't activate them. It blocks other opioids from binding to the receptors and even knocks them off the receptors to reverse an overdose. Opioid addiction is rarely a standalone illness. Frequently, people with opioid dependence are also struggling with a mental health condition. There are both inpatient and outpatient programs that combine medication, health services, and psychotherapy. But many of these programs are very expensive, and the more affordable options can have long waiting lists. They also often require complete detoxification from opioids before beginning treatment. Both the withdrawal period and the common months-long stay in a facility can be impossible for people who risk losing jobs and housing in that time frame. Opioid maintenance programs aim to address some of these obstacles and eliminate opioid abuse using a combination of medication and behavior therapy. These programs avoid withdrawal symptoms with drugs that bind to opioid receptors but don't have the psychoactive effects of painkillers, heroin, and other commonly abused opioids. Methadone and buprenorphine are the primary opioid maintenance drugs available today, but doctors need a special waiver to prescribe them, even though no specific training or certification is required to prescribe opioid painkillers. It's a major problem. Buprenorphine can be so scarce that there's even a growing black market for it. There's still a long way to go with combating opioid addiction, but there are great resources for making sense of the treatment options. If you or someone are so addictive, so um, this is a really big point that I want everyone here to take home is that a lot of the people that are currently like the poster children for the opioid crisis, the response that they get from their communities is basically like, you need to suck it up and do better. Like you got yourself in this position. You need to get yourself out of this position. There are all these resources available to you. Why aren't you taking them? Like relapse once, I get it, relapse twice, that's on you kind of deal. And 
it's a mixed bag because on the one hand, it's really important to give people the respect of autonomy to understand that they can influence their bodies and their minds and their decision-making processes. It's important to give people that sense of like capability that it's not just like, oh, it's all out of your hands. You know, like this is fully the disease model, you know, but on the other hand, it can't be viewed as a binary of someone is just not capable enough of doing this. Someone isn't trying hard enough. In some cases, people aren't trying at all. But in other cases, it's it's almost never that simple. It's almost always a combination of things. So just keep in mind, this is a major way that we look at houseless populations. When we look at people who do not have housing, who use opioids in particular, we say, okay, this person has been using heroin for 12 years, whatever, like you must have really fucked up to get yourself in that position. And the fact of the matter is that if you are going through such a cyclical process of trying and failing to change things because there are so many fucking barriers in the way of you doing it, that is a systemic problem. Really, it is a systemic problem. If someone is in a position where if you are withdrawing from a substance, but you can't miss days of work because you're going to lose your job. If you lose your job, you won't be able to make rent. If you can't make rent, you're going to get evicted. If you get evicted, you're not going to be with housing and possibly will, will like die depending on where you are if you're not housed. Then what other choice do you have? Then to continue the cycle, like hold on to that stick that is keeping you above water until the time has come that you have something else, like a miracle happens where you have the opportunity to do this. Like inpatient treatment programs cost tens of thousands of dollars. It is so expensive to get treatment for this kind of thing. And the fact is that a lot of treatment programs aren't very effective. Like a lot of places use kind of abusive techniques or are fully abstinence-based or are forced treatment programs. Like, this is just not effective. And again, we have to ask ourselves the question, what is the goal? Is the goal to maintain a moral high ground about something, even if what we're doing isn't actually working for anyone? Or is the goal to prevent harm? It helps to... So two major kinds of opioid replacement therapy or ORT, otherwise known as MAT, medication assisted therapy, are dolophine, which is methadone. And methadone is like a very common one. Methadone and suboxone, otherwise known as subs, are the two big boys in terms of medication assisted treatment. So methadone is also used as an opioid to treat chronic pain in and of itself. And buprenorphine, which is brand name suboxone, is exclusively for opioid dependence. So suboxone actually contains naloxone as well. Like suboxone is a combination. Welcome to two minute, welcome uh, to two minute neuroscience. Get out of two minute neuroscience. Stop. So suboxone contains both buprenorphine and naloxone. Um, naloxone is used for alcohol harm reduction. That's interesting. I have not heard of that. We're going to talk about different ways that people are encouraged to kick alcohol, and a lot of them are really ineffective. Like antabuse is basically an alcohol medication where you immediately get a hangover if you drink, but that just makes you feel like garbage and you're no less inclined to drink. It just doesn't really work that well. So here's methadone. Welcome to Two Minute Neuroscience, where I explain neuroscience topics in two minutes or less. In this installment, I will discuss methadone. Methadone is best known for its use in the treatment of opioid addiction, although it can also be used for treating chronic pain. Those are receptors. It's usually administered by mouth in the form of a liquid, pill, or sublingual tablet. Methadone's primary mechanism of action is as an agonist at opioid receptors. In other words, it activates opioid receptors similar to the way other opioid drugs like morphine would. It also acts as an antagonist or blocks and MDA glutamate receptors which is thought to contribute to its pain relieving effects. Because it has a similar mechanism of action to other opioids, methadone causes enough stimulation of opioid receptors to reduce cravings for other opioid drugs and to prevent a patient from experiencing withdrawal symptoms. Unlike most other opioids, however, methadone typically only has to be administered once a day to achieve these effects. Additionally, methadone occupies opioid receptor binding sites, which diminishes any effect administration of another opioid might have, further discouraging someone from using other opioid drugs while taking methadone. Altogether, methadone's pharmacological action lowers the likelihood a patient will abuse other opioid drugs. 
Since methadone has a similar mechanism of action to other opioids, patients also often become dependent on methadone, and some may need to take the drug for a prolonged period of time or even for the rest of their life. Because the drug is administered by a medical professional, however, doses can be controlled, and the risk of fatal and non-fatal overdose for someone on methadone is much lower than for someone who continues abusing opioids. Additionally, methadone treatment is associated with a reduction in intravenous drug use, and thus a lower risk of contracting bloodborne diseases like HIV. Okay, so that's methadone. Methadone is also used in treating chronic pain because it acts as kind of like opioids light. It's less psychoactive, if at all, and it produces the pain relieving effects that people need to go throughout their day, basically. Um, so it, it is a replacement. And again, you can be addicted to methadone. And this is a problem for some people where kicking methadone can really suck if you're on it for a long time. However, it can be extremely useful for moving through the tapering phase of being dope sick without getting high and without needing to worry so much about being super, super sick, especially if you're taking it orally instead of injecting it. Now, the fun thing Welcome about- to two minute uh, neuro. The thing about um, suboxone, buprenorphine, is that suboxone is buprenorphine and naloxone, which is Narcan. Isn't that crazy? Wouldn't you be like, how could you put Narcan in this opioid medication? And the answer is that if you take it as intended, which I think is oral or sublingual, I can't remember which, then the naloxone does not work. It's not active. But if you try and inject it or smoke it, I think as well, but I'm not positive, I know for sure inject it, the naloxone will be active. So it will throw you into immediate withdrawal. So it's a pretty like, yeah, it's it's the root of administration that really dictates that. And the idea behind it is to discourage people from trying to get high on buprenorphine. So that's like the stopper, the stopgap that's in place to discourage that kind of thing. In Los Angeles, approximately one third of deaths in people without housing are from overdose or drug related complications, including alcohol, alcohol is a drug. One in three, that's a lot. Fully preventable too. Housing instability is one of the major determinants of whether drug use is going to be potentially fatal or problematic. Housing instability is an incredibly vicious cycle. If you have not experienced housing instability, don't you fucking dare talk down on people who have housing instability. Seriously, you have no idea. Do not dare. Now, a lot of the time, Law enforcement is charged with the task of picking people up for possession and turning them into the right area, whatever that means. Now, drug courts are a way that instead of diverting people directly into the prison system, you can be put in a drug court instead, which is basically like major probation where there are potential treatment options sometimes, um, but not all the time, that keeps track of a person's journey with sobriety. And drug courts on the surface seem like they might be a pretty damn good alternative to people going to jail for their drug use. But when you dig a little bit deeper, drug courts are just as bad in many ways because they offer this kind of like slight alternative to the existing system where our government decides whether or not you stay on drugs or not. And obviously they will want you not to. And it's the equivalent of forced treatment. You know, like that's what it is, is forced treatment. So Drug courts are kind of a, a weird incrementalist step that we've put in place basically to be like, okay, okay, not everyone's going to jail for drugs. Like some people are just going to drug court instead. But the fact of the matter is that there's usually not adequate support for people in drug court. And it doesn't change the fact that abstinence-based programs are not guaranteed to work for people and not necessarily what people want, especially if someone is like smoking weed and they get drug tested while they're in drug court and smoking weed might be really helpful for them during this time period. And the cycle perpetuates. There is just like not enough support for people in drug courts. So it, it's kind of like a... a false screen that makes things look like they're going better than they are. And a lot of the time when it comes to putting people in the prison pipeline, people will be arrested for using, for possessing, whatever, and they will need to go through withdrawal in a jail environment with no comforts provided to them. Thanks Discovery Channel for when they had actual content. Well, not like first weekend is actual content. Uh, come down yet? Yeah. Stop right there. Think you need to see medical or something? No? 
probation violation. All right, why don't you step in here for a bit? I had a great life. I had a great job, great family. I was engaged when I wasn't using. And then these past two and a half, three years, just been the worst. I've lost everything, everything in life. These marks here are all old. Track marks. These, you see all these little marks right here on my hands? I mean, you can't see any veins in my arms or hands. See, these marks, all these right here, these are all old. These, all these ones, are all new. All the way up here, on this leg, down this leg here, all my whole legs, everything. Those are the new ones. It's pretty bad addiction. I don't even get high anymore. I just do it so I can feel normal. I'm starting to get withdrawals and it's starting to take effect now since I haven't used in almost 12 hours. You start getting cold, cold, hot, cold, hot. You start sneezing a lot, you nose know, starts running, vomiting, you can't get comfortable. Imagine being physically sick with the flu, just where you don't want to move. Your bones ache, your body aches, your stomach hurts. You just feel like throwing up. You just drained of everything physically, and that's what I'm gonna start going through. I'm scared. And let's be honest. So this whole ordeal, because we have to talk money, because people really care about talking money when it comes to drugs. This whole ordeal is expensive as dick. This is like major money sink. $500 billion. This is as of 2016. I actually don't know what the updated numbers are on this. A trillion total was spent, a trillion dollars spent on this in six years, five years. A trillion dollars. Just imagine how many things that money could have funded if we had a better system in place to handle this. Because so much of the money that's spent on the opioid crisis and the war on drugs goes to law enforcement, goes to processing people that are in court, goes to arresting in the first place, goes to holding evidence, goes to the process of like public defenders, goes to the individual systems, the private companies that are contracted to offer their legal services. That includes things like digital databases and ankle monitors. All of those are privately contracted companies. These are all costs sunk into the incarceration system. Now, a lot of the costs have also been sunk into treatment facilities as well, but we're doing virtually nothing to curb this effectively before people are at the point of needing treatment. And we're also doing nothing to curb the behavior of law enforcement or to make changes to law enforcement that makes arresting people for the simple crime of being on an opioid less of a thing to be policed. So Purdue Pharma, let's go back to Purdue Pharma. They were fined millions and millions and millions of dollars for false advertising. And this is something when we go into medications next that we're going to see is basically the case across the entire pharmaceutical industry is that pretty much every single major drug distributor and manufacturer in the world has been fined big bills for false advertising. In fact, I think that if I remember correctly, uh, the maker of Lexapro, I believe, Forest Laboratories, was fined something like $313 million for falsely claiming that Lexapro was safe and effective in treating children following a spade of child suicides. So that's what we see, is that the pharmaceutical industry is a cash cow. Like, I, I think that I might have mentioned this, but in case I haven't said it in a while, the U.S. is one of the only wealthy countries, if not the only wealthy country in the world, that allows pharmaceutical companies to advertise their products. Like, if you think about it, why should a prescription drug company either be able to or want to advertise their product? Isn't the whole idea that your psychiatrist or your doctor knows the medications and picks one for and with you? from available options. Like how weird is it that you can see an ad on TV saying Cymbalta can help. 
like you probably have no idea what a serotonin reuptake inhibitor is. Like, do you know what a serotonin transporter is? And you go to your doctor and you're like, I want some Balta. And they're like, okay, I don't know if that'll work for you or not. But that's the system that we have set up is that people do not have information about what they're requesting in the first place. But there's a lot of marketing, a lot of advertising and kickbacks, which we'll get to next time, maybe even today. Now, in response to this, there have been a couple of people that have proposed like, OK, here are some ways that we can curb the illicit market for opioids. And one of them is the Senlis Council, which proposes this thing called the Poppy for Medicines Project, which basically says, OK, we are legalizing opium cultivation so that people who are growing opium poppies can divert those supplies to making morphine for poor countries. And that's like one way where it's like, oh, that's fucking easy. You literally just legalize growing the plant. Everyone continues growing it like they're already doing it, but they're making morphine instead of heroin, if that's what you're so concerned about. Like people will still get their hands on heroin, obviously, because that's how drugs work. But why not make it legal to grow it while we're at it instead of funneling so many millions of dollars into destroying their crops that they will just replant elsewhere? It's just like, like, man, we could be making so much morphine. We could be making so much morphine, which is basically heroin, just to be clear. Um, okay, so some major risks here that we see are people that doctor shop who go to multiple prescribers and get multiple prescriptions at the same time for opioids or even for opioids and benzos concurrently. Um, taking high doses is a really major risk. Being low income is a really major risk. And also, of course, your personal mental history of having like some kind of negative relationship with substances or having a personal history of mental illness. These are all risk factors, but these are also risk factors that apply to most drugs. The fact is, it's true. Opioids as a class are more easily, I guess, what's the word I'm looking for? Opioids as a class have a chemical mechanism that does indeed make your brain likey-likey a lot. And that's true. You know, not everyone is going to get addicted to them, but your brain is like, I like that. I would like more of that to function properly, please. And the more you do it, bigger doses, of course, the more that's going to be the case. That, like I said, is true for other drugs as well. But opioids, yes, opioids and benzos and like comparable substances, your brain really likes having them around if it's doing them regularly. You are more likely to become dependent on this class of drugs than another class of drugs like psychedelics. It's true. However, how you use it is all in the context. It's all in the context. So some ways of addressing this are detox centers. A detox is like the first step for a lot of people before entering treatment. Detox often is like the place that you go to sweat it out, basically. The place that you go to be monitored while your body withdraws from something. And this is a really uncomfortable process. Detox facilities are not always very nice places to be. Um, and then there are housing programs that help you find stability afterwards. Like there's, there's a network of resources. The problem is that they're often really, really underfunded, really, really understaffed. And in a lot of cases, people just have no access to them. Like much of the time, if you're super poor and you don't have access to consistent internet access and you were not raised using a computer and figuring out how to use search engines, like you're probably gonna have a pretty hard time knowing what's even available to you in the first place. Like that's the thing that people forget all the time, especially about people that don't have housing is like many people who grew up in low income environments who didn't have access to fancy computers in their school's computer lab would not have any fucking clue how to navigate this very complicated and very bureaucratic system. Executive function is partially taught and it's like a systemic failure that a lot of people have so much difficulty finding access to resources and going from point A to point B. You know, like it's not an issue of mental deficit a lot of the time, it's a systemic problem. And we tend to not give any credit to that whatsoever. Treatment alternatives to 12-step programs. Yes, there are quite a few actually. I don't remember specifically what they're called, um, but there are quite a few programs that are like talk therapy oriented or like group activity oriented um, or programs that are intended to meet you where you're at. But a lot of the time they have long ass wait lists or are prohibitively expensive depending. So some ways that we can deal with this are the treatment expansion and overdose prevention. And like, yes, I agree with these, but also we need safe supply. 
like I just don't know like are you guys bored of me saying that I feel like maybe I could start I could do a different phrase like the code word quack quack go is like safe supplies so we could really use some quack quack go up in the opioid crisis like this is that's the nutshell of it like safe supply education in place yes there's obviously still the issue of people getting prescribed opioids and not having accurate information available to them to make informed decisions or not having treatment available if they actually do need treatment yes but like damn can't we just go upstream and just like quack quack go this whole thing that we would have so much less to deal with abolish the police am i right anyway before you use opioids, especially at this point in time, if you haven't gotten them from a doctor directly, please test them. And I say please as an instruction. You need to be testing opioids. You must be testing opioids. It is virtually impossible to find really high quality heroin right now. Fentanyl is in everything across the country. It has always been pretty difficult to find really good quality heroin, or at least for the last 10, 15 years, the drug supply used to be a lot less adulterated because things were easier to produce before all of these limitations were put in place. Like people that were raving or going to discotheques in the 70s and 80s will be like, yo, we had dank drugs and what you thought you were buying was what you wanted to buy. Like at case in point, MDMA, as soon as MDMA started becoming criminalized, the quality of MDMA dropped. We started seeing things on the market that were just like totally out of left field. No one knew how to deal with them. But right now, test your drugs. Fentanyl is active in minute quantities. It is in a lot of stuff right now. This is real. And this should also apply to anyone that's buying anything off the illicit market. Crush it up, dilute it properly, let the water evaporate out, use a card and scrape it off the Pyrex dish, It'll take a few days or you could even stick it in the oven to evaporate all the water faster. Fentanyl test things. It doesn't take that much time. It's so much more fun to get a negative fentanyl test than to learn how to use Narcan on your friend for the first time. If you are injecting something, always make sure to clean the site and use a fresh gear for injection every single time. Do not share needles with anybody else. Even if you're taking minor precautions, it's not going to fix things. Do not rapidly increase your dose if you're using opioids of any kind, including if you are snorting crushed up pills, for instance. You need to take tolerance changes into account. If it's been a few days since you've last used, don't use the same amount that you used last time. Go down by a little bit. Please, if you can, Get your hands on Narcan, keep it in your pocket or in your house. Keeping it in your pocket would be bulky and maybe a little bit weird, but like keep it on your person when possible. If you can to get a tiny backpack that's just for your Narcan. Also kind of weird. Maybe you don't have to do that. Don't mix depressants and opioids. This is a combination that has led to so many deaths. It will slow your heart rate and your breathing. And remember that a slowed heart rate and decreased oxygen intake are the two biggest risk factors of opioid overdose. Losing oxygen. Losing oxygen will make your heart stop beating or go into cardiac arrest. It can also give you brain damage after four or five minutes and not having oxygen. If you're using in a new environment, this goes for all drugs. If you're using in a new environment, decrease your dosage somewhat because your body will not be able to acclimate beforehand because it doesn't expect what's coming. Uh, signs of overdose. And yes, we are going to be doing a whole segment soon about how to recognize medical emergencies of all kinds and respond to them. We talking about recognizing serotonin syndrome, how to administer CPR, basic first aid for stuff like that, um, how to recognize an opioid overdose, what to do in an opioid overdose. But I will tell you right now, just so that we have it on the record immediately, if someone has slow or shallow breathing, is in the process of losing consciousness, they're not responsive to stimulus, um, a good immediate way of doing so, you can do the trapezius pinch, which is like you hit a really shitty nerve that hurts a lot. You can learn how to do that online. It's like the Vulcan neck pinch. Um, but you can also do, if you don't know how to do that, if you must, if they're really not responding to anything, like push on their chest, yell their name. If you need to give a little slap, honestly, it's not going to hurt that much. You know, a little slap, you don't have to punch them in the face. Um, yell, clap, shake them. If they're not responding to those things, take your knuckles, put them on the breastbone, push hard and rub. That's called a sternum rub. If you've ever received one, you know it hurts so bad. 
the point is that you want to give someone a pain signal that they can't refuse. So if someone is like truly unconscious, if someone's just like passed out from drinking, for instance, they'll respond to a sternum rub by being like, ugh, ugh. Done that a couple times at EDC and everyone's always mad about it. <laughs> sternum rubs are like, they should be used as your last resort because really medical professionals should be, ow, I literally just bruised my chest doing that. Like sternum rubs hurt guys. Do not sternum rub someone unless it is like, you have no idea if this person's alive or not. Um, two fingers right here where the jaw meets the neck right in front of this thingy should give you a nice pulse. You should feel their pulse if it's extremely slow. That's a pretty good indicator that something is wrong if it's like super slow. Um, you can also put your hand over their nose and mouth to feel if they're breathing. If someone isn't breathing, immediately call 911. Like the first thing you should always do if you suspect an overdose or even if someone's just passed out and not waking up because you do not want that person to vomit and choke on it. Like actually a fair number of people do die from that. A guy died in a frat house, I think a while ago from puking and choking on it because no one bothered to check him or turn him on his side. Um, turn them on their side. They should not be on their back because um, that way they can puke and choke even if it's just a little and you don't see it. But a really important thing, call 911, but say someone is not breathing do not need police, only an ambulance. You don't have to mention that they took any drugs. When the ambulance arrives, check that there are no fucking cops around a cab and say, this person has taken XYZ thing. I suspect opioid overdose. Please use Narcan, basically. Um, make sure that you say, I only need an ambulance and no cops. Don't tell them drugs are involved. They will send cops. Um, under HIPAA protection, unless you have like bags and bags of drugs sitting out around you, the ambulance folks, the paramedics are not going to search you for drugs. So be mindful of that. If you think that someone is overdosing, take them to a fucking hospital or call an ambulance. Just do it. You know, like there are Good Samaritan laws in place. You should look at the Good Samaritan laws for your state to see what your specific state says in terms of protecting people that are calling for help for other people that have taken drugs. Do not show up to the hospital with drugs on you. You're not gonna be protected that much. Um, oh yeah, once you've called for an ambulance, if someone isn't breathing, start doing CPR, do rescue breaths if you can. Um, and if you have Narcan, do that first and then do CPR. Uh, how much water should be used when testing LSD for fentanyl and carfentanil? I believe what we said was a teaspoon for a snippet of a tab, but we're going to be releasing updated instructions for this soon. It, you really just need a small amount, just like a tiny corner of it. Okay, now on to medications. We're just going to briefly start this one. Now the recap for this is about weed, uh, but we might as well do it because it's been a minute. So cannabinoid receptors, what are the two types of receptors? They're really easily named. If you know one, you know the second one. CB1, CB2. That's right, CB1 and CB2, thank you. So CB1, is found mostly in the nervous system. CB2 is also found in the nervous system, but is uh, also mainly distributed throughout the immune system. So CB2 is going to be more responsible for immunomodulatory effects. CB1 is more responsible for the neurotransmitter effects. Main exocannabinoids are CBD and THC. CBD is non-psychoactive, does not get you high, although it can make you kind of loosey-goosey, relax your muscles. THC is psychoactive. What are the crystalline structures that contain most cannabinoids in weed? Yes, that's right. I see trichomes. Trichomes, that's right. Trichomes. Those are the crystalline bits that contain, they're sticky. They contain most of the cannabinoids. What is retroactive signaling? Anyone remember this? Also kind of on this note, 
I uh, expanded access to the old class quizzes. So they're now up on the website if anyone wants to self quiz and I'll grade them when I can. Yes, that's right. Neurotransmitters go in the reverse direction. But it's not actually neurotransmitters that go in the reverse direction. It's that retroactive signaling involves things going from postsynaptic neuron back up to presynaptic neuron. So the bird flies back up and says, keep it down. And that's how cannabinoids do their work. What part of the brain? Oh, no, that is not. Nope. What's that? Keith. Keith, what's that? Wax. Wax. What's that? Spliff. That's right. Right. So Keith is the basically the siftings from the bottom. You can get a bit of this at the bottom of your grinder. It contains the most trichomes. If you sprinkle a little bit of Keith on top of your bowl, it's going to pack a lot more of a punch. This is an example of a dab, which is wax. It's a kind of concentrate, cannabis concentrate. And then a spliff is tobacco mixed with flour, mixed with weed. So for medications, a psychotropic medication is a chemical substance that changes brain function and results in changes in perception, mood, consciousness, or behavior. Gee whiz, doesn't this sound an awful lot like the definition of drug? Isn't that funny? It's literally just like we just defined what a drug was. So a psychotropic, if you see psychotropic medication, this is basically interchangeable with psychoactive. It means it's something that changes your perception, your mood, your consciousness, your behavior. It's not inert like Tylenol, although I actually think that I remember reading that taking acetaminophen or Tylenol can actually cause mood changes, but I don't remember that fully. I think it can cause apathy actually at significant doses. Um, we're gonna talk more about the pharmaceutical industry in the future in this concept of big pharma. Let me preface this by saying that all the medications that we're gonna talk about have the potential to drastically positively influence a person's life, possibly for many, many years or the entirety of it. Um, for other people, these medications are wildly unsuccessful. And that really is a testament to the fact that we have so many drugs on the market and so many billions of individual brains that are all slightly different from each other. And we're trying really, really hard to homogenize ways to make people feel better. But that's super, super difficult. So three of the major um, categories of psychotropic medications are anesthetics, analgesics, and mental health medications. We'll go into what each of these are. There are more subcategories and more general categories, but these are generally the ones that can have a psychoactive effect sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes. An anesthetic is something that is sedating and causes a lack of consciousness. The point of this is to knock you out, basically, and it does this by acting on glutamate and GABA. So remember, glutamate, excitatory neurotransmitter of the brain, it facilitates communication between neurons. GABA, inhibitory neurotransmitter of the brain, it slows down, reduces communication between neurons. So this sets up a situation where if you are incre or sorry, decreasing the effects of glutamate, you're going to be reducing communication between neurons. If you're increasing the effects of GABA, you're also gonna be reducing communication between neurons. So this gives us the idea that if something increases GABA or decreases glutamate, I should have done that backwards. If something decreases glutamate or increases GABA, that gives us a pretty good initial idea that that thing is probably gonna be some kind of sedating, at least at some level of application. Like ketamine. Ketamine is used in general anesthesia as an aid to other anesthesia. If you're doing bumps of it at a party, you're probably not going to completely black out. But if you're doing multiple hundred milligram lines, you're probably going to be fully anesthetized at some point. That's going to happen eventually. <laughs> I'm sorry for your sinuses also because that's very uncomfortable. So an anesthetic will knock you out sedation, lack of consciousness, or just like general lack of coordination, lack of communication between brain and body. So again, if we want to reduce communication, we would either decrease glutamate, which is our communicative neurotransmitter, or increase GABA, which is our non-communicative neurotransmitter. Both of those will have similar effects in slightly different ways. Then there are analgesics, which are for pain. So this includes opioids, for instance, and also inflammation as a concept. If we're going to reduce pain, we increase opioid signaling. Opioid receptors in the brain are more activated in some way, shape, or form. 
and we are increasing the amount of natural protection against pain signaling, suppressing pain signaling. But then there can also be anti-inflammatory things because inflammation is a major source of pain. Inflammation is thought to be the root cause of a lot of things, actually. Things from like um, pain during cancer to depression as a whole. Inflammation is like a major contributor to depression, we think. So if you see something that is a glutamate antagonist and an opioid agonist, you can immediately get an idea of like, oh, this thing is probably going to eventually knock me out if I take enough of it. And it's going to reduce communication between my brain and my body. And it will probably reduce the amount of pain that I feel. Case in point, dissociatives, ketamine, PCP, you name it. They probably are going to decrease the activity of glutamate and increase the activity of opioids. That's how you can get away with my favorite story, head banging too hard at a slander show ending up in the ER the next day because you didn't realize that you sprained your chest because you were too high on ketamine. Then there's mental health substances. And there are so many of these, obviously, but some of the general categories are antidepressants, which usually typical antidepressants act on serotonin, but there are lots of different kinds, which can be stimulating sometimes. Anxiolytic medications, which are for anxiety reductions. And there are a lot of mechanisms we can do this with. Anticonvulsants, which are seizure reducers, the likelihood of a seizure is lower. And this is often done through GABA agonism. So reducing the amount of communication because seizures are the result of excessive uncoordinated brain activity. So if brain go haywire, seizure happen. If you put something like an anticonvulsant, like a benzo on top of it, then that will reduce the signaling in the brain and calm the likelihood of seizures. And then antipsychotics. And antipsychotics reduce dopamine levels. Now, that might be surprising to some of you, but we think that some of the major mechanisms of psychosis are related to increased dopamine activity. So um, this is something that we're not going to get super into because the science behind it is ever evolving and somewhat complicated, but antipsychotics decrease glut I'm sorry, don't, oh my God, please, <laughs> dopamine activity, I'm so tired. Uh, two bouts of caffeine in a day make Rachel a slow bitch by the end of the night. So uh, antipsychotics are notorious for being apathy inducing in some cases. Now, oftentimes, interestingly, antipsychotics like Haldol are prescribed or are given to people that present to emergency rooms with symptoms of psychosis. I mean, who are high on psychedelics is what I meant to say. I would hope that antipsychotics would be given to people that present to ERs with symptoms of psychosis as well as psychedelics. The last thing I'm going to say for the night is this concept of the illustrious half-life, which is great timing because this will cut us off right before we dive into the big stuff. A half-life is the amount of time that it takes for the concentration of a drug in your body to be half of what it started as. But it's not enough to say, oh, the half-life of Prozac is six hours. I don't know if that's correct. Um, I think the half-life of MDMA is like five hours or something. So let's say that it's not enough to say, oh, the half-life of MDMA is five hours. So in 10 hours, it will be totally out of my body because half-life, that makes sense. That's not quite how it works because every time you half it, the next time you have that and the next time you have that and have that and have that. It's dividing by two a bunch. For a drug to be pretty much entirely eliminated from your system, you should calculate five half-lives approximately. That goes 50% and then 75% and then whatever is between 75 and 100%, 80, 87.5% and then so on and so forth. And by the time you're at the fifth iteration, it's like between 97 and 99% or something like that. This is very useful for a lot of things because if you are trying to figure out if you can, for instance, taper off a medication in order to start tripping again or whatever, then you need to know how long until that drug is totally out of your system. However, it gets sticky sometimes because there are some drugs like irreversible MAOIs where it takes a full two weeks for MAO to be rebuilt in your system. Now, that's a lot of jargon that I'll explain in more detail later. My point is, you should always do research on the half-life of the substance in question, but you should also try and understand the pharmacology of whether that substance has lasting effects outside 
of the time that it's acutely in your body. Otherwise, you could still risk interactions. So an interesting quasi example of this, please don't take 5-HTP within 24 hours before you do MDMA. The reason is that having that 5-HTP still in your system, not eliminated, could give you serotonin syndrome. This is not speculation. This is like there are a lot of anecdotal reports of people having serotonin syndrome symptoms from taking 5-HTP too soon before or after they roll. So be aware of that. That's all for this evening. Small class tonight. So start sending out more regular emails. Um, I'll see you guys on Tuesday. We'll finish up the medications segment and then I don't even know what's next. Then we move on to something else. <laughs> Have a great night, everyone. I'll answer questions for a second.